And so there was I, again, together with the BBC uh, crew, with this young man, this new Masob leader, almost exactly the age of uh, Christopher Okibo. Now, it could be, of course, that in reality, I was also looking, that throughout that journey, I was looking for Christopher Okibo. Because the focus, the highlight of my visit to Enugu on that occasion was that encounter and that poignant meeting which I had with Christopher at the police station. After all, I'd been more or less, you might say, softened up. My mind had been prepared for that occasion by yet another quester, this time Obi Agili, who was also looking for her father and who finally ran me down in New York and uh, told me she was going to start uh, the foundation of her father. Of course, I was most enthusiastic and I promised uh, to do everything uh, I could to help. And she then engaged in the series of paintings, some of whose uh, uh, photographs you've seen, and held an exhibition in London, which I attended together with uh, uh, Skip, and an exhibition we, which we made every effort to bring to this conference. Unfortunately, uh, dollars stood in the way. So you could say I was already uh, psychologically prepared uh, to look, to find Okibu wherever. And I could have been superimposing that subconscious uh, desire on the persona of this man, who could not be more different in personality uh, from Christopher Okibu. He was very dapper, uh, neatly suited, spoke very quietly. Christopher Okibu was a very excitable uh, uh, character. This one even carried a, uh, an ivory-topped uh, cane. But the passion, the intensity, and the commitment was exactly the same as I remembered in Christopher Kibo. And this is why I perhaps just saw all the time I was speaking to this young man. Uh, in fact, I don't think I paid so much attention to what he said, since it was all being recorded anyway. I was just looking at him all the time and saying, here we go again. Here's Christopher Kibo all over again. I'm trying to explain to myself why this superposition took place. He could not, as I said, have been more different uh, from Christopher Kibo. Uh, the master leader did not, if it had been Chris, he would have whipped out his uh, manuscript straight away and said, okay, tell me how this sounds. Uh, the master uh, yeah, youth did not read uh, poetry during our midnight assignation. But what he articulated, what burned in his eyes was not far different, not too distant. The vision of history in the remaking. History, perhaps, illusory history, perhaps, but nonetheless, the consummation for him of a prolonged ideal, bringing to reality a state of nation being that was not contaminated by hands that remained for him forever stigmatized by the blood of his forebears. Those who wish to understand this, again, non-judgmentally, should study the recent history of Yugoslavia. The bitter past was deeply internalized in that youth, had become the summative experience of his existence, leading to his own transformed state of being. The transforming moment of the life of any individual, and especially one of deep poetic sensibilities, that moment when the content of the core changes dramatically, is one that can never be predicted. One can only speculate, but I imagine that when news of the magnitude of that day, I'm talking about this August 6 or 7 or 8, we began the trip on the 6th. Now when news of that recent military engagement after our passage through Nietzsche eventually sifted through to this young man, he also would have read it as the defining moment of his life. The affirmation of what he had heard before, what he had read, whether in reality exaggerated or truthful, even as a non-poet, what he had seen simply as the call, the definitive transmission of his life mission. And guess what? Although this youth had no pretension 
towards poetry. He had embraced, he had anchored his entire sensibilities in on a poetic sibling, mythology. I'll explain. In the course of our exchanges, he announced quite simply that he belonged to the Jewish race. We're Jews, he said. Oh, he did not even state this as a metaphor of negative experience. No, but as an assertion of origin in its own right. He went into a long exposition of this racial conundrum. We have it all on tape, fortunately, because as I said, I found myself merely staring at him, not only half listening, since everything was being recorded. So I, I can't even remember how the, the, the genealogical exposition that he made on this occasion. But he went into it, he said, we're Jews, we know that. We know that we have been, even been to Israel, he said, on pilgrimage, you know, going home. Somehow or the other, he was caught in this, uh, in this world of non-reality uh, around the core of an experience. He was very young, you know, obviously he wasn't uh, born at the time of the Civil War. But for him, his entire, his, the, the entirety of his existence were wrapped down around the core of that negative experience. We took pictures. He didn't even care if the pictures fell, because I asked him, I said, are you sure? He said, no, no, no. He said, I don't care. He said, I'm ready. I'm saying to you, sir, Biafra is not dead. Biafra will rise again. And uh, he was ready, just like Christopher Okibo was. There's an incident worth recounting, one that only a few individuals are aware of. I told his daughter of this incident just a few months ago. A while before the war, and certainly before the federal uh, the uh, formal declaration of Biafran independence, I ran suddenly into Chris in Brussels. I may have forgotten some details, but not the name of the hotel where we met. It was Hotel Königshof, overlooking a port, or maybe just, uh, I remember it just overlooking a wide basin where lots of ships were berthed, not just uh, yachts. We literally bumped into each other. Uh, in the hotel premises. I don't remember who saw the other uh, first. This was the Christopher Okibo who had simply evaporated. Months earlier, just like many Igbo, prominent or un unknown, who'd retreated to their homeland after the second round of massacres which had taken place in October 1966. Not a word had come from Christopher, not even a message to assure us on the, this side, on the um, his Imbari colleagues and so on, that he was well. And suddenly, there he was, large as life. I have to mention, by the way, that Chris and I, we tended to relate to each other uh, at times in an uncannily intuitive way. I mean, give an example of how we just, my brief moment at the police station, there Okibo came, and certain, uh, certain passages of knowledge between us. It was very strange. It was manifested so many times that I was left in no doubt uh, about it. I turned suddenly to Chris while we sat in the bar, at the bar, and this was to Chris, whom I knew as a non-violent person, as virtually a pacifist, and I said to him suddenly, Chris, you are here to purchase arms. It's a very strange moment. I hadn't thought it out. I wasn't even aware of the moment I blotted it out. I said, Chris, I know what you're doing in Brussels. You came to buy arms. So he hemmed and hawed and denied it. He said that uh, no, he was, uh, yes, involved in, uh, in strategies for confronting the federal side uh, if they turned to hostilities, but it was mostly on the uh, international side. He gave me, he tried to persuade me anyway that he was there as an ambassador uh, for the uh, state, the forthcoming state of Biafra. So I said, all right, uh, I said, leave it. And so we went, uh, uh, we went uh, on the town. The evening obviously called for a celebration. And uh, two weeks later, I think two weeks, three weeks later, a plane crashed in the Cameroon on the way to Biafra. On it were uh, cases of arms and some personal effects and documents. 
documents belonging to Christopher Okibo.